بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تمسك بهديه إلى يوم الدين وبعد we talk about the concept of تقوى الله the fear of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and being an obedient servant to Allah Rahman and trying one's best to avoid being a disobedient servant to Ar-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a constant and consistent theme of the lectures, the khutbas, classes, the books, and the reminders. And this is something which is worthy to be a constant and consistent theme. Because it's a constant and consistent theme of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The very first commandment that we find in the Mus'haf Ya ayyuhu al-nasu abudu rabbakum al-ladhi khalaqakum min nafs Allah says what? Ya ayyuhu al-nasu abudu rabbakum al-ladhi khalaqakum wal-ladhi na min qablikum la'allakum tattakum The very first command that we find when we read the Qur'an is that Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, O mankind, worship your Lord who created you and created those who came before you for the purpose of you obtaining taqwa. So the first command was ibadah, tawheed, but it's connected and it's linked to taqwa. So we talk about being pious and being righteous, actualizing Allah Azza wa Jalla's tawheed first and foremost, and avoiding sin, staying away from mutiny, ma'asiyah against Allah, disobeying Allah Azza wa Jalla. The question now has to come, how do I avoid disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do I avoid being disobedient? And rebellious to Allah, the mighty and the sublime. And reversing the wisdom by asking yourself the question, how do I fall into disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What happens? What's the cause of me making this sin or falling into this sin? What's the cause of sins? The main causes. Not the specific things. Going to a bar. Being alone with a woman whom you're not married to. Oversleeping. Not setting your alarm clock. But we're talking about the general principles. How a slave falls into disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are four main reasons. Or four main channels. Ways that sins fall upon a slave. That's mentioned by Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. Four ways. Four points of defense. That it should be your job and your duty from the time you wake up in the morning. Until the time you go to sleep at night. To make sure that you have checked off on your list. And for you to control these four channels. Guard them. And keep a close vigilant watch on them. Four things. I guarantee and Allah knows best. If you made that your daily task. And your daily struggle and battle. You'll be a better Muslim. And a more pious Muslim. By the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Qayyim he says. وَأَكْثَرُ مَا تَدْخُلُ الْمَعَصِي عَلَى الْعَبْدِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَبْوَابِ الْأَرْبَعَةِ فَنَذْكُرُ فِي كُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِنْهَا فَصْلًا يَلِيقُ بِهِ وَقَبْلَ هَذَا قَالَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ وَلِهَذَا قِيلَ مَنْ حَفِظَ هَذِهِ الْأَرْبَعَةَ أَحْرَزَ دِينَهُ اللَّحَظَاتِ وَالْخَطَرَاتِ وَاللَّفَظَاتِ وَالْخُطُوَاتِ فَيَنْبَغِي لِلْعَبْدِ أَنْ يَكُونَ بَوَّابَ نَفْسِهِ عَلَى هَذِهِ الْأَبْوَابِ الْأَرْبَعَةِ وَيُلَازِمَ الرِّبَاطَ عَلَى ثُغُورِهَا فمنها يدخل عليه العدو فيجوس خلال الديار ويتبتر ما على تتبيرا He says ويتبر ما على تتبيرا He says here Some people they said That any slave, any servant of Allah Who looks after four things And he protects himself from four channels or four aspects he says, then he won't fall into sin. And he will protect his religion. The first is, he says, Allahabat. What you see, what you look at. How your eyes move. Controlling one's eyes. Controlling one's eyes. He says, Wal khatarat wal khatirat. He says, Al khatarat. He says, footsteps. Or not footsteps, excuse me. He says, khatarat, thoughts. What you think about. What you think about it, how you think, if you daydream, if you ponder and reflect on something. He then says, وَاللَّفَظَاتِ And things that you say, things that you utter. Your tongue. Last but not least, he says, وَالْخُطْوَاتِ 
in actual footsteps. Actual footsteps, i.e., your eyes, your mind, everybody clear on this? Your tongue, and where you go. What place are you in? Where do you reside? Everybody clear on this or not? So, first and foremost is the eyes, looking at something. And then stopping and thinking about that thing. And then actually talking about it. Even if it's just idle talk. And last but not least, being in places that you have no place being in. He says, so therefore the servant of Allah, Rahman, it is his duty to be a guard and a gatekeeper upon these four gates. He has to constantly be on watch at all times. His eyes, his mind, his tongue. And his feet, the sister as well, her eyes, her thoughts, her statements, and her movements. He says, when the slave, bidden in the night is vigilant with regards to these four things, he'll protect his deen. And he says, and when a slave is lackadaisical and heedless and falls short from protecting him or herself from these four or at these four, he says, that's when the enemy penetrates. That's when his fortress huh, has been invaded and laid under siege. They break through the wall and attack your deen. He then says, and these are the most dominant or predominant reasons behind people falling into sin. He says, so let's explain them and let's mention all four in detail. فَمَنْ أَطْلَقَ بَصَرَهُ أَوْرَدَهُ مَوَارِدَ الْحَرَكَاتِ وَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تتبع النظرة النظرة فإنما لك الأولى وليست لك الآخرة وفي المسند عنه صلى الله عليه وسلم النظرة سهم مسموم من سهام إبليس فمن غض بصره عن محاسن امرأة لله أورث الله قلبه حلاوة إلى يوم يلقاه هذا معنى الحديث وقال غضوا أبصاركم واحفظوا فروجكم وقال إياكم والجلوس على الطرقات قالوا يا رسول الله مجالسنا ما لنا منها بد قال فإن كنتم لا بد فاعلين فأعطوا الطريق حقه قالوا وما حقه قال غض البصر وكف الأذى ورد السلام والنظر أصل عامة الحوادث التي تصيب الإنسان فإن النظرة تولد خط ابن قيم إذن says first is one's gaze what one looks at he says in the gaze the eyes he says رائد الشهوة it's the leader of one's lust the leader of your desires he says ورسولها and the messenger of one's desires it's the front and the back the first and the last the eyes, as we say, the gateway to the soul. He says, in protecting one's eyes, protecting one's gaze, that is the foundation. That's the fundamental principle of protecting your chastity. If you look at everything, there's no way that you're going to be chased sexually. If you're selective at what you look at, you protect your gaze, you don't look at what you're not supposed to look at, whether it's haram or not. Then that is a key factor in you keeping your chastity. That's a key factor in you being chased and not falling into that which is haram with regards to one's sexual desires. He says, anyone who looks at anything and everything, he will be destroyed. It will lead him to utter destruction. He then goes on to cite some proofs and evidences to prove this. The first of them is the hadith that states that the Prophet is supposed to have said, لا تتبع النظرة النظرة it says, if you look once, then don't look twice. You have one look, don't take a second look. Because the first look was for you in your favor, and the second look wasn't. It also states another hadith. He says, anadratu sahmun masmum. He says that a gaze, one look, is a poison-tipped arrow. A poison-tipped arrow that's shot and thrown or hurled by Iblis. He says, so anyone who lowers his gaze... From a beautiful woman and also a, a, a woman looking at a handsome man for the sake of Allah, then Allah will put a sweetness in his heart 
until the day in which he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It also says in another hadith, غُضُّ أَبْصَارَكُمْ said to lower your gaze, وَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَكُمْ and protect your private areas, protect your chastity. Now we know all of those hadiths that we just mentioned, Ibn Qayyim, all of them aren't necessarily the most authentic hadiths, but perhaps one will say that their meaning is clearly authentic and supported. That the meanings are clearly authentically supported from Quran and from authentic hadith. He mentions another in which the Prophet ﷺ said, He says, Beware of sitting on the side of the road. Don't just sit there and just lounge and sit on the stoop. He says, Don't do this. The companions, they said, O Messenger of Allah, we have to sit here. These are our places of gathering where we talk, where we get to know. Each other, where we see what's going on in the neighborhood. We have to. We have to have some type of social gathering. So the Prophet says, if you have to, then at least give the road its due rights. Give the road its due rights. The companions, they said, and what are the due rights of the road? The Messenger of Allah, he said the following things. Number one, غض البصر, lowering the gaze. If you want to sit, if you want to sit on the corner, stand on the corner, if you're going to sit in a barbershop, if you're going to sit at the rest stop, wherever you are, then make sure that you don't look at everything. You have to lower your gaze. He then says, after lowering the gaze, وَكَفُّ الْأَذَى He says, in repelling harm from the people, don't curse the people, make fun of the people, littering, making noise, smoking, drinking, playing loud music that disturbs the people. He says, don't do any of these things, vandalize or whatever the people do. Which is adha, which is the means of harming people. Littering. Littering. How many Muslim countries you go to and you walk down the street and the roads and it's full of trash? And the people they live in basically landfills, which is a small tiny strip that a person walks, and on the right side, on the left side, it's full of trash and garbage. That's adha. That's a means of uh, annoyance and harm. Last but not least, he says, waradu salam, and returning the salutations. Returning the citation. So if you're going to sit, then you must sit with a responsibility. He says, so therefore, when a person looks at something, he says, that is the basis, that's the foundation of most of the things that happens to a person. He then says, فَإِنَّ النَّظْرَةَ تُوَلِّدُ خَطْرَةً ثُمَّ تُوَلِّدُ الْخَطْرَ الْفِكْرَةً ثُمَّ تُوَلِّدُ الْفِكْرَةَ الشَّهْوَةً ثُمَّ تُوَلِّدُ الشَّهْوَةُ إِرَادَةً ثُمَّ تَقْوَى فَتَصِيرُ عَزِيمَةً جَزِمًا he says, and that's because when a person looks at something, he gets a thought. And when a person gets a, a thought, he gets an idea. And when a person gets an idea, he gets a lust. And then when a person gets lust, there is an intention, irada. A person wants a thing. And then that intention, he says, it becomes resolute determination. I have to have it. I have to have this thing that I looked at. Looking. Thinking, huh? having an idea, then a person wanting and desiring, lusting, and then when a person lusts and lusts and lusts and lusts, it must turn into, he says, azima, jazima, no doubt. A person says, I need this thing, I have to have it. He says, فَيَقَعُ الْفِعْلُ And then the action takes place. And it's a must that the action takes place unless something comes and prevents the person from doing it. Unless something stops you, it's going to take place. Whatever that thing that stopped you, this woman that you're lusting over, she told you no. Or the man that you're lusting over, he told you no. Or you tried to walk and you got hit by a car. It was an emergency. Something took place that stopped you from falling to that lustful thing. Or whatever it is. It doesn't just have to be a man and a woman. It can be other things as well. Money. Stealing. Whatever the case may be. وَفِي هَذَا قِيلَ الصَّبْرُ عَلَى غَضِ الْبَصَرُ he says, and based off of this wisdom, based off of this wisdom, it is said, it's easier to lower your gaze than it is to deal with the problems and the pain and the suffering that comes from not lowering the gaze. Stop and think about how profound this is. Something that you want is easier, even though it takes sabr. It's a little painful. It burns a little bit. You want this thing. You can have this thing. He says, but that pain is lesser than the pain that comes from after you've fallen into it and you have to deal with the consequences. So let's stop once more and think about 
the concept of uh, zina, adultery and fornication. When a person looks at a woman, looks at a man, they think, they feel, they have an idea, they become lustful, and they have determination to get that thing. It causes their body, their mind, their heart, their soul, some type of pain, and not getting it. No question. But then making that haram act, the pain that ensues, which of the two is more costly? You talk about STI, STD, getting pregnant, you're still in high school, getting a girl pregnant, you're still in high school, dying in that state, or even if you get away with it, you don't get an STD or STI, or she doesn't get pregnant, you don't get pregnant. Think about the disgrace, the shame, the dishonor. Think about the iman that will be stripped from you, the sweetness, the love of Allah that will be taken out your heart and replaced for the love of a human being. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So everything we know in life is based off of cost and value, everything. And that's how powerful people think. Powerful people, they determine things based off of costs. I would like to go here and do this, but how much will it cost me? What do I have to give up? What do I lose? What does it cost? Every, you, never, you can never be around a powerful person except that this is the most important thing that he has in his mind. Nahum Sheikh Idris, and that is the cost. The cost. How much will it cost me? So look at it like this. The zina may be good. may feel good. You may enjoy some type of sweetness. But the bitterness is more than a sweetness. In any other type of haram act that's based off of one's eyes. Qala shair he then quotes a poet who said, كُلُّ الْحَوَادِثِ مَبْدَاهَا مِنَ النَّظَرِ وَمُعْضُمُ النَّارِ مِنْ مُسْتَصْغَرِ الشَّرَرِ وَكَمْ نَظْرَةٍ بَلَغَتْ مِنْ قَلْبِ صَاحِبِهَا كَمْ مَبْلَغِ السَّهْمِ بَيْنَ الْقَوْسِ وَالْوَتَرِ وَالْعَبْدُ مَا دَامَ ذَا طَرْفٍ يُقَلِّبُهُ فِي أَعْيُنِ الْعِينِ مَنْقُوفٌ عَلَى الْخَطَرِ يُسِرُّ مَقْتَلُهُ مَا ضَرَّ مَهْجَتَهُ لَا مَرْحَبًا بِسُرُورٍ عَادَ بِالضَّرَرِ the poet, he said, Kullul Hawadith. He said, all things that happen and take place are based off of the gaze. What a person looks at. Everything that happens is based off of someone's eyes. He says, and most of the fire comes from small sparks. Most of the fire comes from small sparks. No matter how big a fire is, it has to come from a what? Small spark. Well, however you make that fire, however you like that fire, gas, wood, you use a flint, whatever. It's always something what? Friction, a match. And then there's a blaze. The poet then said, Kam nazratin. He says, how many people looked at things? And the things in which they looked at struck their hearts like an arrow. It pierced their hearts like an arrow. He says here, uh, towards the end of the lines of poetry, he says, a person is happy about harm and death through a small piece of pleasure. He says, La marhaban. He says, there's no welcome. We don't welcome pleasure that comes with harm. No one is going to welcome a pleasure that comes with harm. وَمِنْ أَفَاتِ النَّظَرْ أَنَّهُ يُوَرِثُ الْحَسَرَاتِ وَالزَّفَرَاتِ وَالْحَرَقَاتِ فَيَرَى الْعَبْدُ مَا لَيْسَ قَادِرًا عَلَيْهِ وَلَا صَابِرًا عَنْ وَهَذَا مِنْ أَعْضَ مِنْ عَذَابِ أَن he says that from the problems of looking at everything and gazing at everything is that it causes a great deal of depression and sadness. A great deal of depression and sadness. And that is because a person sees something that he always doesn't have the ability to get. And he doesn't have the patience to do without that thing. He looks at something that he lusts, he covets, and he can't get that thing. And at the same time, he doesn't have enough suffer to avoid that thing. Let's stop and look at our culture now. People who go to the store and go shop. Many people, they say, I don't want to do what? If I don't have no money, I don't want to do what? No window shopping. What's the point of me going and looking at the thing that I want, that I need, and I don't have no what? No flus. Or look at the inner city. Crime, selling drugs, killing people, shooting people, robbing people. Where are these things, what are they based off of? Sometimes people have a necessity, they have no choice, no option. They may be forced into it, pressure into a gang. They had to defend themselves, whatever the case may be. But most, or a lot if not most, they do it based off of seeing things 
that they want but they can't afford. Material life. Material things. Money, women, jewelry, whatever the case may be. So therefore, I can't afford this car. I can't afford this jewelry. I can't attract these type of women that I want. I don't have the ability to get it, so therefore, it forces me into a what? A life of crime. And then what happens when I commit crime? I get away with it for a little bit. It's okay for a little bit, but you can't win. You can't beat the game. There's no one has ever successfully walked away from it without a major scar. Death, life in prison, or a major part of your life stripped away from you that you can never ever get back. Wounded, maimed, whatever the case may be. My brother was shot to death right next to me. My, my mother was killed because of me. They came looking for me. They busted the house and they shot out my family. How are you going to live for the rest of your life? They shot your mother, your little sister, and your, your aunt looking for you. You can never, ever, ever live with yourself for the rest of your life. So the point is, is that once the, the shaitan gets the person to look at these things and to gaze and to lust and to covet, and he has no sabr and no ability to get these things, then it's nothing more than ruin. Everything after that is ruin. Why the other? But now we all know the case in the inner city, in the urban city. Many of our lives, how they've been affected. Our fathers, our mothers, our uncles, our aunts, the people that we used to look up to. It's all down here once you go incarcerated, unfortunately. In most cases. In most cases. Except for the people whom Allah Azza has mercy upon. Except for the people whom Allah has mercy upon. And I'm sure those brothers and sisters, they can tell you the difficulty of going against the grain of going against the system that's made to continue to make you unsuccessful after incarceration. And it all starts from one's eyes, looking at something that a person shouldn't be looking at. He then says, um, to the next point, um, with regards to the second way that the shaitan enters, or that the slave falls into sins, وَأَمَّا الْخَطَرَاتِ فَشَعْنُهَا أَصْعَبْ فَإِنَّهَا مَبْدَعُ الْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ ومنها تتولد الإرادات والهمم والعزائم فمن راعى خطراته ملك زمام نفسه وقهر هواه ومن غلبته خطراته فهواه ونفسه له أغلب ومن استهان بالخطرات قادته قصرا إلى الهلكات ولا تزال الخطرات تتردد على القلب حتى تصير منا باطلة كسراب بقيعة يحسبه الظمآن ماء حتى إذا جاءه لم يجده شيئا ووجد الله عنده فوفاه حسابه والله سريع الحساب وأخص الناس همة وأوضعهم نفسا من رضي من الحقائق بالأمان الكاذبة واستجلبها لنفسه وتحلى بها وهي العمر الله رؤوس أموال المفلسين ومتاجر البطالين ويقوت النفس الفارغة التي قد قنعت من الوصل بزورة الخيال he says here, as far as number two, that is the thoughts, one's thoughts. He says that the circle or the ring of the thoughts is smaller than that of the gaze. And that's because the thoughts could be good or the thoughts could be bad. The thoughts could be positive or the thoughts could be negative. He says, and from thoughts, ideas, things that pop in your head, you become determined and resolved, like we just mentioned. He says, so anyone who looks after his thoughts and he's mindful of his mind, what you think about, what you daydream about, he says, then he will control himself. And one who thinks about anything and he allows himself to daydream and to become lost in his thoughts, he says he'll be ruined and he'll be destroyed. Not thinking about the haram, don't entertain the thought. As soon as it comes to your head, repel it, seek Allah's refuge. Change the subject in your head. And if you can't change the subject, it's too strong, then at least think about the harm from thinking about those things. If I do do it, this is going to happen to me. And I'm going to be right back where I started. I'm going to fall deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. He then says a person will continue to think and think and think until he becomes delusional. Delusional. And a person has long overextended hope. Thinking that a person can achieve something and do something that he's not capable or willing of doing. Everybody understand this? And this is, applies to crime as well, or drug addiction as well. The average person who does drugs, they ask them, why do you continue to abuse drugs? All of these years out of your life you've wasted. You've destroyed yourself, those who are around you. In most cases, whether they tell you with their own words or through their actions, 
they're basing their addiction off of a thought. And that was the initial high. The first high. The first high was so powerful, so unexplicable, that it continues or a person is continuing like a rat in a wheel. Walking and running over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that's based off of one's what? One's thoughts. Instead of a person realistically saying to himself, it's gone, colossus. It'll never ever come back. There's no point in getting stuck upon that. But people who don't control their thoughts, they continue to run that rat wheel. And if you talk to anyone who's ever abused drugs, heavy drugs, and those who've successfully walked away from drug addiction, whether it's crack cocaine or anything else, most of them, they'll tell you, they say, what? The hardest struggle wasn't the physical struggle. That's the simple part. That's the easy part, which is difficult in itself. But the hardest thing was the what? The mental game, the mind games that your nafs plays with you, that the shaitan plays with you. And that's the hardest and most difficult fight is to control your mind. And that's why they say, a person, you stop smoking crack, but you still think like a crack fiend. You still think like a drug addict. You still have the crack fiend mentality of quick, of fast, of getting over, of this and of that. I'll make up. I'll quit when I want to. That's the most difficult thing to change. So the thoughts is the main, the second main channel of sins entering upon the slave. Ibn Qayyim, he then goes on to talk about procrastinators, people who always are delusional. They think about things, they daydream about things that aren't a reality. And he quotes the verse in Surah Al-Nur, Allah he says, Kesarabin bin He says, like a mirage in a wasteland. Yahsabahu dham'anu ma'an. He says, the one who's dying from thirst, he sees this mirage and he thinks that it's an oasis. Hatta idha jahu. He says, and when he approaches this supposed oasis, lam yajidhu shay'an. He finds nothing. He finds nothing. There's nothing there but sand, burning sand. Wa wajid Allah indahu. فَوَفَّاهُ حِسَابَهُ وَاللَّهُ سَرِيُّ الْحِسَابِ There he finds Allah and Allah gives him his full recompense and Allah is ever swift in reckoning. And then he talks about people who are pleased with being delusional. People who procrastinate. People who think, 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 think. And that's the only thing that they do and it oftentimes leads them into making sin. A person leading into making sin. He then goes on to say وَهِ أَدَرُ شَيْءٍ عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ he then says, and it's based off of laziness and lethargy. When a person just thinks so much and dreams so much. And oftentimes that gets a person into leaving off that what he's supposed to do. Or doing to that which is haram, that which is disliked. And when Qayyim Rahim Ta'ala, he then goes on to say, ثُمَّ الْخَطَرَاتُ بَعْدُ أَقْسَامٌ تَدُرُ عَلَىٰ أَرْبَاتِ أُصُولٍ خَطَرَاتٌ يَسْتَجْلِبُ بِهَا مَنَافِعَ الدُّنْيَا وَخَطَرَاتٌ يَسْتَدْفِعُ بِهَا مَضَارَ دُنْيَا وَخَطَرَاتٌ يَسْتَجْلِبُ بِهَا مَصَالِبَ آخِرَتِهِ وَخَطَرَاتٌ يَسْتَدْفِعُ بِهَا مَضَارَ آخِرَتِهِ He says, last but not least, one's thoughts are divided into four categories. The first is that which is a means of benefiting yourself in this world. Number two, thinking about how to keep harm away from you with regards to this world. Number three, it's thinking about that which will benefit you in the hereafter. And number four is thinking about that which is a means of protecting you from harm in the hereafter. In the hereafter. Then Ibn Qayyim Rahim al Ta'ala, uh, he speaks about this in great detail. With regards to sins, with regards to daydreaming, with regards to procrastinating, and the importance of controlling one's mind. Number three. بَلْ لَا يَتَكَلَّمُ إِلَّا فِيمَا يَرْجُو فِيهِ الرِّبْحَ وَالزِّيَادَةَ فِي دِينِهِ فَإِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يَتَكَلَّمَ بِالْكَلِمَةِ نَظَرْ هَلْ فِيهَا رِبْحٌ وَفَائِدَةٌ أَمْ لَا فَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهَا رِبْحٌ أَمْسَكَ عَنْهَا وَإِنْ كَانَ فِيهَا رِبْحٌ نَظَرْ هَلْ يَفُوتُهُ بِهَا كَلِمَةٌ هِي أَرْبَحُ مِنْهَا فَلَا يُضَيِّعُهَا بِهَذِهِ He says, as for statements and how a person falls into sins because of his or her tongue and the shaitan attacks you and he penetrates your fortress through your statements. He says, and this means for a person to refrain from talking unless it's something that is of benefit. And even if it's something which is beneficial, one must ask himself before speaking, could I have said something which was better? And if I say this, will it prevent me from saying something which is more thorough and more beneficial for myself? 
Who thinks like this? The average person. The average person from among us, we don't think before we talk. Let alone those who do want to say something which isn't haram. But it is a, is it a benefit. And if it is a benefit, maybe I can say something which is even better. Maybe that's not the best thing to say. And if I busy myself speaking about this or this to this person, maybe it would strip my time from doing something which is far more substantial. So he says here, for a person only to speak when it's based off of rib. He says what? Profit. And the same is applied to the worldly life as well with regards to businessmen, with regards to military strategy, playing chess. You don't move the piece unless it's a means of benefit. No matter what pressure is put on you, if there's no benefit, don't move. Don't go to war unless it's profitable to the state. Not because the men says we have to fight. It's not a profit, so it's no point in moving. And if it is a profit that's moving, maybe we can wait and do something even bigger and better. Make a stronger and more powerful move. And it's an immature chess player. He, he sees here, let me move this. But the experience says what? You could have done that and got a bigger piece or made a more strategic move. And this is the concept of chess, upon which we often make an analogy between chess and life. It's a big game of chess. Is that you have to look at the pieces. You have to ponder carefully. And it's one of the most basic and simple differences between a beginner, between a novice, and someone on the way to becoming a master. And that is looking at the pieces, observation. A person is hasty. He just moves. Or he moves something which is good. It's not a bad move, but you could have done something which was what? Far better. Defensively or offensively, let alone at the same time. And this is applicable to one's tongue. Let me shut up if it's of no good. If it's no good, let me not say it. If it is good, then let me think. Maybe I can say something which is what? Better. Or maybe there's someone else that can say it better than me. And let me refrain from speaking. Huh? If we were just to implement this basic principle... The quality of our lives would instantly soar. Our marriages will be far happier. No question about that. Our minbars will be far more blessed if those who are upon those minbars took this into consideration. What am I going to talk about today on Friday? I have 232 people here just in this masala, not including the people that are in the basement. How many people are going to listen to my speech? This is a good thing to talk about, but do they need this? Or is it something which they need even more? Something that's even more practical, even more applicable. What happened that? Ibn Qayyim Rahim al he then says, وَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَسْتَدِلَ عَلَى مَا فِي الْقَلْبِ فَاسْتَدِلَ عَلَيْ بِحَرَكَةِ اللِّسَانِ فَإِنْهَا يُطْلِعُ مَا فِي الْقَلْبِ شَعَ صَاحِبُهُ أَمْ أَبَى He says, whenever you want to know what's in someone's heart, then look at a person's tongue. Look at what they say. He says, the tongue is the indicator of the heart, whether a person likes it or not. Whether you like it or not, that which comes off of the tongue. ibn Mu'adh, al-qulubu kin qudur, taghli bima fiha, wa al-sinatuha magarifuha. Yahya ibn Mu'adh, from the people of the past, he said, the hearts are like pots. Al-qulubu, he says, al-qulub kin qudur, they're like pots. He says, they boil and they, they pours out and it spills out that which was in those pots. He says, and the tongues are the ladles of the pot. You want to taste the flavor of the soup, the broth, Nam? You do what? You scoop it out. That's what's in a person's heart, what they say. He says, فَانْظُرْ الرَّجُلْ حِينَ يَتَكَلَّمْ فَإِنَّ لِسَانُهُ يَغْتَرِفُ لَكَ مِمَّا فِي قَلْبِهِ حُلْوًا وَحَامِضًا عَذْوًا وَأُجَاجْ وَغَيْرُ ذَلِكَ وَيُبِينُ لَكَ طَعْمَ قَلْبِهِ اِغْتِرَافُ لِسَانِهِ He says here, so when a man speaks, look at what he says. His tongue is the ladle, is the spoon of that which is in his heart. Hulwan wa hamidun. Is it sweet or is it sour? Is it tasty or is it bitter? Or anything besides that. He says when his tongue is moving, that's him scooping and digging the pot of his heart. What he says upon his tongue. And this is applicable universally. Even if someone says something that's good to you. Something that is a means of praise. If you pay attention and you stop and you think about how they said it and when they said it and who in front of they said it, it shows the opposite as well. And that's why they say overseas in a famous proverb, they say, It says when someone is talking with a tongue of honey, beware of that person. Beware of the person's tongue that's laced with honey. A person is always praising you, saying good, 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 good. 
In most cases, it's a trap. It's a, 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 a trap. A, huh? a trap. A trick. And Allah knows best. He then says, "Hey, كما تطعم بلسانك طعم ما في القدر من الطعام فتدرك العلم بحقيقته إلى آخر كلامه رحمه الله." وفي حديث أنس إن المرفوع لا يستقيم إيمان عبد حتى يستقيم قلبه ولا يستقيم قلبه حتى يستقيم لسانه. It states in the hadith of Anas bin Malik عنه, that a person's iman cannot be straight until his heart is straight and his heart isn't straight or cannot be straight until his tongue is straight. And the Prophet was also asked what is the most frequent reason behind the people going to hell? He says it is the mouth and the private part. The mouth and the private part are the two main reasons people going to the fire of hell. And this hadith has been authenticated by Imam Tirmidhi, rahimahullah. وَقَدْ سَأَلَ مُعَاذٌ النَّبِيَّ صَيْ سَلَمَ عَنِ الْعَمَلِ الَّذِي يُدْخِلُهُ الْجَنَّةِ وَيُبَاعِدُهُ مِنَ النَّارِ فَأَخْبَرُهُ بِرَأْسِهِ وَعَمُودِهِ وَذِرْوَةِ سَنَامِهِ ثُمَّ قَالَ أَلَا أُخْبِرُكَ بِمِلَاكِ ذَلِكَ قَالَ بَلَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَأَخَذَ بِلِسَانِ نَفْسِهِ ثُمَّ قَالَ كُفَّ عَلَيْكَ هَذَا فَقَالَ وَإِنَّا لَمُعَاخَذُونَ بِمَا نَتَكَلَّمُ بِهِ فَقَالَ ثَكِلَتْ كَأُمُّكَ يَا مُعَاذِ وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسَ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى وُجُوهِهِمْ أَوْ عَلَى مَنَاخِرِهِمْ إِلَّا حَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ قَالَ تِلْمِذِي حَدِيثٌ صَحِيحٌ He then says here, and Mu'adh رضي الله عنه, he asked the Prophet ﷺ how he would go to paradise. What would be the deed that would put him in Jannah? And what would be the deed that would keep him far from the fire of hell? So the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't just tell him, he didn't just give him the answer. Ibn Qayyim says he told him the top thing, the most important thing, the capital sums, the cream of the crop. He says, بِرَأْسِهِ The most important part. And then he told him, Should I not tell you the anchor of all of that? The thing that, ga- that gathers all of those different pieces in one place? He says, Of course, O Messenger of Allah. The Messenger of Allah, he grabbed his tongue. And he then said, Kuffa alayka hadha. He says, control this. Control your tongue. Watch what you say. So Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, he said, will we be taken into account? With that which we say, O Messenger of Allah, on the day of judgment, we're responsible for our words. The Prophet ﷺ was amazed and he was shocked. And he said to him a very harsh statement in which the Prophet ﷺ didn't intend to say. Or he didn't intend the meaning behind. It was something that the Arabs, they would say and it wasn't something that they actually intended. He says, Thakilatka ummuk. He says, may you have no, he says, may your mother be bereaved of you. May, you. may your mother lose you. As we would say in our culture, what? What are you talking about? What did you just say? Are you stupid? What? You say something like this. Like, What's the matter with you? He says, Thakilatka ummuk. He says, may your mother lose you. He says, will the people be taken and dragged upon their faces except because of what their tongues put forth? Is there any other reason behind the people being disgraced and humiliated in the hellfire except because of what? With their tongues. Then Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he goes on to explain this in much detail. Moving on to the fourth and final way that the slave falls into sins. He says, وَأَمَّا الْخُطُوَاتِ فَحِفْظُهَا بِأَنْ لَا يَنْقُلَ قَدَمَهُ إِلَّا فِي مَا يَرْجُ ثَوَابَهُ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي خُطَاهُ مَزِيدُ ثَوَابٍ فَالْقُعُودُ عَنْهَا خَيْرٌ لَهُ وَيُمْكِنُهُ أَنْ يَسْتَخِرِجَ مِنْ كُلِّ مُبَاحٍ يَخْطُو إِلَيْهِ قُرْبَةً يَنْوِيهَا لِلَّهِ فَاتَّقَعُ خُطَاهُ قُرْبَةً He says, as far as the fourth, and that is one's footsteps, one's movements. He says, in protecting one's movements or one's footsteps, it means not to lift up your foot unless it's a means of you getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't take a step unless you have in your mind, this is something which will take me closer to Allah and further from the fire of hell. This is just like the tongue as well, and just like one's thoughts as well. It's something which is critical. And before we move on, mentioning speech of Ibn Qayyim, it goes to show us the severe responsibility of the Muslim on a daily basis. And if you wake up and you think that you have the day off and you don't have to be careful and you don't have to work hard and be conscious and responsible, then you're living in a dream world. Every single day is a major jihad that you have to fight. Every single day. And the moment you let your guard down, the moment you become laxed and lazy is the moment in which you will slip. There is no day off, there's no vacation when it comes to spiritual, the spiritual fortress. Every single day is important. 
Every single day, you have to fight yourself and you have to fight the shaitan every day. He says, so looking at your feet and not lifting up your foot and putting down your foot unless it's a means of you getting the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there's no reward, there's nothing extra that you can achieve spiritually, he says, then it's best to sit down. Just like we mentioned with regards to the tongue. Don't move the peace unless it's a benefit in moving that peace. Let the peace stay where it is. He says here, and when a person thinks like this critically, every single step that he makes, if he has the proper intention, it can be a means of him being rewarded. Just think of how many steps you take from your house to your car. How many steps you take from your house to work. And I go to work with the intention of feeding my family. I go to work with the intention of paying zakah. I go to work with the intention of giving sadaqah to the masjid. I go to work with the intention of sending money back home to my relatives that are still in the country from which I've migrated. Every single footstep that you make is a means of ajr, reward, thawab. Huh? So this is something which is serious. وَلَمَّا كَانَتِ الْعَثَرَةُ عَثَرَتَيْنِ عَثَرَةُ الرِّجِلُ وَعَثَرَةُ اللِّسَانِ جَاءَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا قَرِينَةً أُخْرَى فِي قَوْلُ تَعَالَى وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا وَإِذَا خَاطَبُهُمْ وَالْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا فَوَصَّفَهُمْ بِالِاسْتِقَامَةِ فِي لَفَظَاتِهِمْ وَخُطَوَاتِهِمْ كَمَا جَمَعَ بَيْنَ اللَّحَظَاتِ وَالْخَطَرَاتِ فِي قَوْلِهِ يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ he says, since one slipping, when a person slips or trips, a better translation, when you trip, you stumble, it's two ways of stumbling, two ways of tripping. The first is with the foot, and the second is with the tongue. I.e., one's footsteps and one's statements, he says, they are connected. They're like twins. They go hand in hand. Since this is the case, Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentioned this in the Quran. He mentioned footsteps, and He mentioned tongue in the statement. Allah, he says, وَعِبَادُ Rahman And the slaves of Allah, Ar-Rahman. And everyone is a slave of Rahman. But Allah means the chosen slaves of Ar-Rahman, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, they are those who walk calmly and peacefully on the earth. Serene. They're calm, they're cool, collective. وَإِذَا خَاطَبُهُمْ الْجَاهِلُونَ And when the ignorant people talk to them and speak to them, قَالُوا salama. They say no more than peace. That's it. They don't curse them, they don't slander them, they don't fight with them, they don't argue with them. It's nothing more to tell them, salam. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Okay, that's great. Right. Sure. That's all you have to say. So Allah, He mentioned yamshun. They walk. And then He also mentioned what? Qalu. They say. Everybody see how it's linked? And then He says, just like, uh, so He mentioned that they are mustaqim. He says they have mustaqimun. They have istiqama. And what they say and how they walk. Just as Allah Azza wa has mentioned one's gaze and one's thoughts in another ayah, in which Allah says, يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةُ الْأَعْيُنِ That Allah knows the deceptive gaze, the deceptive eyes. Then He said, وَمَا تُخْفِ sudur," And that which the breasts conceal, i.e. one's, one's thoughts. So they're connected. So therefore these are four things, four channels we said which are means of a slave slipping and falling into disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first was one's eyes. The second was one's what? Abdul Khawi? The gaze. Thoughts. Statements. Then, footsteps. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us from all of these four and to strengthen all four of these gates for us on a daily basis. Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Jazakumullah khairan.